Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our June 2nd uh, Bible study. Friendship Wesleyan Church, 7 p.m. normally Wednesday nights, uh, in-house and online. But uh, many of you are probably aware that I'm presently on sabbatical. So what a cool thing through technology we can meet anyway. So this week, the 9th and the 16th, It'll only be online, and then beginning the 23rd, Pastor Jason is going to do online and in-house for those three weeks. I'll be back on July 14th. So as most of you are probably aware, we are in the book of 2 Corinthians. If you're new with us, grab a hold of our supporting materials, reading plan, and everything on our website, friendshipwesleyan.com. Go to our ministries and Wednesday evening ministries, but we're in 2 Corinthians. We're in the third week now of a 12-week study. So, you know, I last week I said you almost didn't use the outline, but this week we're going to, we're actually beginning to dig into this outline that I showed you from, once again, the Bible Project. Check out their video on YouTube, 2 Corinthians introduction video by Bible Project, and you'll see this you can watch an eight minute plus video of this outline. But anyway, tonight, um, no, I gotta tell you, I gotta give you a little heads up because I've made a decision over the next couple of weeks to kind of hang out on one item in the text. I, I know I say like I try to do that, but we end up covering uh, much of the text in so many ways, not every verse. But I'm, I'm, I'm really trying these next three weeks um, for time's sake and preparation, um, mainly, but to, uh, to find something in the text to hang out on that. And he, so here's what it means. Should be, uh, you guys, those of you that know me know this may not be the case. We'll find out this evening. But shorter Bible study a little bit in, uh, in this online version. Um, and, and then it means if you want to understand the broader part of the text and everything, you're going to have to do some of your own digging or deeper digging than you might do otherwise. So, but uh, if you've been following along with me, you probably have a good idea how to do that now, and you can do that. So, um, you will know the text that we are, um, was our reading for this week, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 through 3, 18 includes some of the beginning of this outline you see. Remember, it starts over here, Acts chapter 18. The church was founded. Paul had heard reports of what was after he left Corinth about problems, difficulty, sin that uh, was taking place in the congregation in Corinth. And so he writes his first letter, makes a painful visit to them, and then this second letter um, and then last week, we actually kind of went over what happened here in them, some of them being bothered that he hadn't made a second visit. In 2 Corinthians, he shares his love for them, despite we, we really uh, began to take that walk some last week in our study. Uh, now, uh, this, the text this evening brings us uh, all the way through the old covenant, comparing with the new covenant. And, uh, and so um, you come back or you can go to last week and pull this up, kind of pause it, take a look at it um, for yourself. But once again, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 through 318. And I, I'm not sure I said this when I was explaining to you about um, trying to find one thing. Boy, it just happened naturally in this text. Um, I'll, I'll give you a heads up. I didn't get past. Uh, chapter 2, verse 17. I didn't get much into chapter 3. I did a little bit, but for time's sake, I'm not going to really go into those things. So the bigger part of what we were going to tackle here in chapter 3, you'll have to study on your own. So grab your Bibles, open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and let me begin uh, with a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We're thankful we're grateful tonight for technology that brings us together, even when we can't uh, be in person. Uh, we're online and studying your word, walking through 2 Corinthians, Father. 
and we're we're mindful that we cannot do this on our own and understand your word. We need your spirit to guide and lead us. So, Father, I pray uh, that the, that you would, uh, through the power of your spirit, teach us your word tonight. And I've often said this, Lord, if it means that that you've got to reveal to me something that might be painful, we're open to that too tonight, Lord. We want to grow. We want to be more like Christ. Um, we want to love each other more. We want to love you more. We want to love each other more. So reveal your word to us. And according to what's said here, Lord, we we want to be a, a an aroma <laughs> that is a witness for Christ. And so guide and direct us now in your word. We pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, so um, I want to begin with verses 12 through uh, 13. Let me read them for you. Now, when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, chapter 2, verse 12. Remember, we've already worked up to this far. Um, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. So Paul... Titus isn't there. Um, we mentioned this, might have been week one, maybe. Um, Paul, it, it was week one, that uh, Paul didn't find Titus there. And so he leaves, he leaves Macedonia. Now, I don't, I don't know if it's helpful for you. Um, I find maps very helpful for me. Um, this is a map. You guys know I use them every so often of Paul's third missionary journey. Uh, the solid line represents where he started out from and then his journey. And then the dotted line um, represents his return trip, um, which is going to take us. Here's what he's referring to, Troas. Um, and so you can kind of get a, and if you've got a bigger bigger image of the world and um the part of the world we're talking about here um, in Europe and the Middle East and, and Israel and Jerusalem, then you can kind of put this into context as to where Paul is, uh, is talking about. And so I mentioned that that first week that Titus was missing. And, uh, and so it, it, here's my takeaway from this. Because um, even then in week one, I, I, I kind of, I was leaning into the possibility that Paul was, you know, he was uh, wondering where Titus was. Like T Titus just like came up missing in the ministry or whatever. I think really though, that this, these couple of verses really represent Paul's um, love for and belief in the partnership in ministry. So th this, these verses, I don't think they're so much, like I, I had mentioned in week one, that he didn't know where Titus was, as he didn't have Titus with him there in ministry. <clears throat> and so the reason for leaving Macedonia, Macedonia was the team wasn't fully together. It reminded me a little of Philippians chapter one, three through six, which I just love. I'm not going to read the full con the whole thing for you, but um, it's in that text that Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you and, of, and in all of my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Read the book of Acts and watch Paul. <clears throat> Everything was about teamwork and partnership. And Paul didn't like to do things um, alone, but in teams. It, it, Jesus had it as well. He sent them out two by two, remember. He liked us to be in teams. So um, Paul's discouraged that Titus isn't there and moves on um, from there. So here's where I'm going to get a little stuck now. We're going to spend most of the rest of our time and it, and it starts with a question, then we'll read the text. Did you know that as a believer, you are supposed to be an aroma for the Lord, a pleasing aroma? Um, 
that I don't know why there's some humor in that for me to think. I, and I think it maybe it's culture, or whatever. We don't think of ourselves as being a smell, you know, for um, the world around us, those around us, um, those we love, those we care about, the people around us to be a smell and uh, aroma. But the biblical text, all the way back Old Testament and even in the New Testament here, we've got this whole idea of of smells going up before the Lord and aromas. And some of you either have seen or have the image, um, if you, depending on the, the Christian tradition you come from, um, you may have seen incense and smells used in the service or whatever. Um, doesn't happen in our Wesleyan tradition, but some of you may be familiar with those kind of images. And that's actually from the biblical text. Um, and and uh, we've got this whole idea of the smells going up before the Lord. And we're going to see that in this text. So verse 14 now, I want to pick it up. I think I'll just read 14, 15, 16, 17. And then that's the big thing where we're going to get, we're going to get uh, stuck for the rest of our time. Verse 14, but thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. I'm glad that the, the Bible makes it clear that we're not an unpleasant aroma, right? Although we could spend some time on that, right? Right? If you're not living for the Lord the way that you should and um, being a poor witness or whatever, we might call that an unpleasing aroma. It's possible. Um, we could think of some things there. Um, to the one, verse 16, to the one, we are an aroma that brings death. To the other, an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. And of course, once again, Paul's um, bringing up their, their honesty and their dedication, commitment um, to the Lord. But this, this is bigger than that. I got to doing my digging and I found a very interesting disagreement here on the text. As a matter of fact, I think it's safe for all the places I've showed you um, in the text where there's dis disagreements between translations or debate over meanings. This is one of the most profound and interesting that I've found. Hopefully, we can make some some sense of it. I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, say that we'll make complete sense of it, but hopefully, we can make some sense of it. But it begins in that first verse that we read in verse 14. Um, now I'll bring up the slide here in a minute. I have that actually that verse. I should have done it where they came in in sequence and we can look at the first verse together. But it's verse 14 of chapter two. But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us as that aroma. So let me show you that this was very interesting. When I look at various translations on this. What I found out is there, there aren't, there are very few that actually use this word captive, but thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us spread the Roman amount of memory. And I've got to tell you, I had a change in my thinking about a text. I've, I've never really had a change like this while I'm studying. So you're going to, what you're going to hear from me is a little bit of a change in what I've thought about this text. Um, I'll tell you what I think traditionally we've thought about it and then my, my new thing. But look at the ESV, uh, the English Standard Version, which many of you use, many people use. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. First question is asked, why the difference? And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. This is the same text, verse 14. Um, and I will say this up front that the ESV really has it more literal and it deals with this word triumphal. We'll get to that in a minute. So here we have it in all these texts. This is a paraphrase, um, but thank God 
the New Living Translation, but thank God he has made us his captives and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. Now he uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. And so, um, so here we have this, and, and I'm trying to give you, because it would have been nice to have like 30 different translations so you can see. Very few. Most of them stick with um, the, like the ESV here. Matter of fact, in my about 30 translations, I only saw the NIV and the NLT. I understand in my reading, there's a number more than that, but only these two that actually have the word captive in there, the way that we see it here right now. So the thing you have to understand, I think the beginning point is what Paul's imagining, what he's thinking here when he uses that phrase, who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession. Now, if you do deeper digging and study here, you'll find out there are very few biblical scholars, anybody that disagrees with the, with the fact that Paul most definitely was imagining a Roman victory procession. Uh, the, you know, when the generals would, would win battles and they would come back into Rome and they would have these victory processions. Matter of fact, I've got some images here for you as I read a this description for you. Here's the first image I have. Doesn't really show clearly what I'm about to read. I found a commentary that gave, actually I found multiple ones. I like them all, but the, I'm going to use this one. I'm going to do some reading. I don't, I don't usually do a lot of outside reading for you, but I want to, so that you kind of understand what Paul is imagining here. Of course, the general is Jesus. Um, I, I thought a little revelation when he was riding in on a white horse, but uh, Paul is imagining these Roman victory processions. So here's what the commentary says. In a triumph, the pro procession of the victorious general marched through the streets of Rome to the capital. First came the state officials and the Senate, then came the trumpeters, then were carried the spoils taken, taken, taken from the conquered land. Then came the pictures of the conquered land and models of conquered citadels and ships. So in this processional would also be the captives, okay? Um, there followed the white bull for sacrifice, which would be made. Then there walked the captive princes, leaders, and generals in chains, in chains, shortly to be flung into prison, and in all probability, almost immediately to be executed. Then came the lictors bearing their rods, followed by the mus musicians with their lyres. And listen to this. Then the priests swinging their censers with the sweet smelling incense burning in them, the smell of victory in Rome. I read another one that said that Rome would have been, would have had all kinds of incense burning everywhere for this processional. After that came the general himself, finally came the army wearing all their decorations and shouting low triumph, their cry of triumph as the perfect procession, here's another image I found that gave us a little more of what it might look, but, you know, the other direction as they were coming in. They were decorated, garlanded amid the cheering crowds, made a tremendous day, which might only happen once in a Roman's lifetime. So what's the debate? You know, Paul's, Paul's imagining this triumphal procession and, uh, and, and the, the debate also gets us into why the word usage in the NLT and the NIV is the way that it is. And the debate centers around, did Paul actually mean that we were the captives in the processional? Um, that, that's what the way the NIV reads is um, uh who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal process. So it, they're, you know, why are they reading captives into that? So many translations don't. And uh, <clears throat> the argument or debate centers around 
the word triumphal. I mentioned that a moment ago. We'll get to that. But I found some very interesting stuff on a blog from Biola University. I wanted to just a few sentences um, about this whole thing as well. And, and what the author is writing about here is what the traditional view of this verse is. So listen as I read it to you. The implication of this verse, as I was taught as a young Christian, was that Christ, the victorious general, was leading me as a member of his conquering army in a grand victory parade. So if that's the case, kind of hard to insert that word captives in there because you're the victors in the parade, not the captives, the captives in the parade who may even be put to death in short order, right? It makes sense. <clears throat> the rendering of the King James Version gives even greater calls for optimism. You can go there and look at it. I didn't include that in our slide for you. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. So just not just the procession, but all of life. We have the triumph in Christ, which I agree with. But what are we trying to get at in this text? So let's look at the words. I said to you that um, this all centers around the, the word triumph in the text here. So the first thing you need to see is that when it comes to the words, what I did was is I took um, the, uh, and I've, I've showed this to you before. If you're not familiar with, this is somewhat what the order in Greek would be like, original Greek, you can see the English over here. Two, however, godly thinks the one always leading in triumph us in Christ. So you can see, and then I'll click on these numbers over here and I go find the definition of these Greek words. The one we're going to zero, on, zero in on is right here. But you can see, even at this stage of our word study, the word captives is not there, okay? But if you go click on 2358, this is what you'll see. The Greek word for triumph, the definition to triumph, its usage to... I lead one as my prisoner in a triumphal procession. I lead around, make a show, spectacle of, calls to triumph. So here's the deal. You have to understand how um, we know certain things about, like Greek words, biblical, ancient Greek, biblical Greek. One of the ways we know is how we find its usage, e even outside the biblical text in other Greek, te Greek texts. So, so the deal is nowhere else in Greek literature is this word triumph used in any way other than to lead as a prisoner in the triumphal procession. You see where I begin to transition a little bit, my traditional understanding of this as we're victors in the processional, maybe we're captives. Maybe we were, maybe Paul's saying, and, uh, and actually, that's kind of how we reconcile this a little bit. How could Paul depict himself? Was he actually describing himself as a conquered enemy that may be being led uh, by God to his death? And so here's the thing. We do have some places where Paul actually does that. So uh, you're going to, I don't have it on the PowerPoint for you. So you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 4, 9. And, and here he's going to talk about a procession again. Listen to this. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 9. If you're there, say amen. I think I heard most of you. <clears throat> Just teasing. <laughs> For it seems to me, 1 Corinthians 4, 9, that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those content, condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe. So just to get into Paul's thinking, and we don't, no way to be 100%, I, I admit that. But Paul's thinking, but thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession, 
it makes sense that maybe that's what Paul was thinking. Um, so it shouldn't surprise us that maybe here that's kind of what Paul was thinking as well. And so back to um, my commentary, when I had this, I'm going to read a few lines for you from this, because it really helps to then begin to make sense of okay, how do we accept that then if we were um, if we're the captives in the procession. We haven't even got to the aroma yet. You see, I told you I got stuck. Um, uh, the imagery of 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16 that we read actually represents Paul's theology of the cross in its most vivid and arresting form. As the analogy of the Roman triumph and the incense-filled parade route continues in verses 15 and 16 that we have here, we find Paul portraying his crushed and vanquished apostolic ministry as the means through which the aroma of the crucified Christ is medi mediated to, the, to those around him. We knew Paul, as a matter of fact, we're going to get that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that Paul saw, saw God's power in being in weakness, kind of the opposite of what we would think. Um, it's going to be interesting to get into that. So uh, Paul understood the paradox that God's strength is most potently displayed through his own weakness and suffering. What is is clothed in metaphor in 2.14 is later stated explic explicitly. So for Christ's sake, and this is over in chapter 12, I'm telling you about, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I love the closing line in that text, so much so that I brought it here for you. See if I can find it. There we go. God ministers more powerfully through our tragedies, our brokenness, our weakness, than our triumphs. What we see, even, even I think as followers of Christ, we've got these big images of victory and triumph. But the word clearly tells us that it comes in our brokenness and then God's healing through that, God's work through that. It is the broken vessel that reveals the true treasure with, within. And actually, um, you know, uh, we're, we're going to deal with that um, a, little bit, a little bit later, um, not just in chapter 12, but in, in other ways as well, this whole idea. So the point, here's the point. Remember, we like to get to the point. <laughs> the point isn't whether we are captives or not, but that Christ is the victor and we're his representatives. Um, the, you, this, uh, uh, another, the translation or the, the new, uh, another uh, translation that I found actually tries to make this whole idea of being on display because that's the aroma thing, is being a pleasing aroma, a smell to those around us just as in that pro processional. And here's a translation Holman Christian Standard Bible that tries to insert that. But thanks, this is the same verse 14. It's going to look a lot different. But thanks be to God who always puts us on display in Christ and through us spreads the aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. So, th so this one is really trying to bring the whole thing together that we are we have to be conquered. Um, we have to make Jesus Lord. We have to let him be the processional victor conqueror. And we have to be willing um, to give in to him. And it's through that, that we get put on display for the world to see a Christ as the general, as the Lord, as the, as the leader. Um, and so being an aroma, right? Matter of fact, you know, way back there, I read that the priests were the aroma that went along with the processional. So look at verse 14 again, um, the a part of that text that it didn't really zero in. We read it, but it didn't zero in on it. And uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. 
puts us on display to be um, the salt and light. You may have heard that to to be a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. You are the aroma of Christ, who is the victor. <clears throat> And I thought to myself, a good thought in closing is, but the question for us is, have we allowed him to be Lord of our lives um, and allowed him to conquer our will, our selfish us, and let him lead um, the procession of our lives so that we can be that, which raises the big question of, have you given your life um, to Jesus Christ? If you're uncertain as to exactly what that means, um, rather than spend another 20 minutes here, I might some evening, but you can go to our website, friendshipwesson.com, and go over to the ministries again, um, and you will find a great uh, some great resources and links to exactly what that means. It means realizing that I'm a sinner, confessing my sin, asking God to forgive me through his son, Jesus, um, and asking God to help me through his spirit to lead a new life in Christ. That's it. The rest of the study is up to you. You can see we didn't even get into chapter three. Next week, we're going to try to zero, zero down to a singular topic or something in that text as well. So you do the extra work ahead of time. If you actually do it in that way, at least do the reading so you know what we're going to uh, be talking about. So uh, and the reading plan is on our website. Let me have a word of prayer for us. Heavenly Father, thank you. Um, for the responsibility of being the aroma. But, but Father, we're grateful that it doesn't come in our being big, strong, wonderful people, but and, and proving ourselves in any certain way. Father, it actually can come in our weaknesses and in our brokenness and in our tragedies, because it's in those things you use them for your glory. Father, how many times have I heard stories of people's lives? And what they're talking about is how you worked into the brokenness in their lives and brought healing and, and newness into their lives and, and then use that as an aroma to, to the world, Father, and encouragement to us who already believe. And then, Father, um, uh, a smell to those who aren't, uh, that they would come to know you and, uh, and be saved. So, Father, bless each and every home that's viewing tonight. Um, thank, I pray that your spirit will be with them, bringing peace. Father, you know, a lot of, lot of days, a lot of moments, I just say, peace of Jesus, peace of Jesus. Your word's saying, be anxious about nothing, but everything by prayer and petition, present our request to you with thanksgiving, and your peace will guard our hearts and our, and our minds in Christ Jesus, peace of Jesus in every home. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless. Have a God week.